honorable speakers and discussants, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to our first ever Jakarta Forum 2020, hosted by the Chinese Mission to ASEAN and Philippine Mission to ASEAN, and organized by Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. My name is Cindy from SPCI, and I will be your Master of Ceremony for today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jakarta Forum series is designed to promote dynamic intellectual collaboration between the relevant stakeholders in the ASEAN-China relationship. And today our forum topic will discuss ASEAN-China cooperation in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. But before we begin, I would like to welcome our special guest here today. This morning we have with us the permanent representatives to ASEAN, oh. starting with His Excellency Ade Padmo Sarwono of Indonesia. Selamat datang, Pak. His Excellency Noel Servigong of the Philippines. Hello, uh, Ambassador. His Excellency Yip Sam Nang of Cambodia. His Excellency Ekafak Pantabong of Laos. His Excellency Kamsia Kamarudin of Malaysia. His Excellency Aung Myo Min of Myanmar. His Excellency Kok Lee Pung of Singapore. His Excellency Pasporn Sanga Subana of Thailand. Ms. Nora Mali Jumat, Charge Affairs of Brunei Darussalam. And last but not least, Nguyen Viet, representative from Vietnam. Welcome, Excellencies. Now, without further ado, to kick off the Jakarta Forum 2020, I invite the permanent representative of the Philippines to ASEAN, His Excellency, Mr. Noel Eugene Eusebio Servigon, to deliver his opening remarks. Please, Ambassador. His Excellency, Sung Kwok, Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN Sociocultural Community. His Excellency, Jose Tabares, Director General of ASEAN Cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, Their Excellencies, the Chair and Members of the Committee of Permanent Representatives, His Excellency, Deng Sijun, Ambassador of China to ASEAN, Dr. Dino Pati Jalal, and our distinguished partners from the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, esteemed participants, good morning. As country coordinator in Jakarta for ASEAN-China Dialogue Relations, it is my honor to welcome you to the first Jakarta Forum on ASEAN-China Relations for the year 2020. Today, we make history as this is the first ever Jakarta Forum held virtually since its inaugural session in March 2019. As we all can attest, the coronavirus pandemic has forced us to quickly innovate and interact in new ways. But while our medium is different today, the principles that guide ASEAN-China dialogue relations remain the same. Solidarity, friendship, and cooperation, especially during difficult times. And no other topic is more relevant today than how we can band together to emerge victorious over a microscopic threat that has spawned enormous consequences for our region and for the world. Early on January, we saw the mobilization of existing mechanisms and platforms of the ASEAN health sector together with senior officials of the ASEAN plus three to share critical technical information. This was followed by the meeting of the ASEAN plus three health ministers on February 3. On February 20, the foreign ministers of ASEAN and China met in Vientiane. There they outlined the ways we can step up cooperation through the exchange of best practices to effectively combat COVID-19 in various areas such as prevention and control, diagnosis, treatment and surveillance, as well as on risk communication and community engagement. Our foreign ministers also underscored the need to strengthen cooperation within ASEAN-led mechanisms and with external partners to comprehensively address the pandemic. They also made commitments to reduce the impact of COVID-19 
on the economic and social development of all affected countries. On April 14, the special ASEAN Plus 3 Summit on COVID-19 was held via video conference. The APT Summit resolved, among others, to strengthen the early warning system in the region for pandemics, to enhance the national and regional capacities, and to consider the setting up of a reserve of essential medical supplies. These proposals are all aligned with our collective aspiration to effectively respond to current and future challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, all these special video conferences emphasize that effectively addressing this pandemic requires a whole of ASEAN community approach. The spirit cooperation to combat COVID-19, which began early this year, continues today with this forum. I wish to thank our organizers and all our distinguished discussants and experts for sharing their time and knowledge this morning. I look forward to a robust exchange of ideas on how to address this present challenge and to ensure a better future for all our peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now begin today's discussion by inviting our moderator for today's event, co-founder of FPCI and research professor at LIPI, Professor Dewi Fortunanwa. Thank you very much, Cindy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we are going to have uh, a very lively discussions about this ASEAN-China cooperations on how we can overcome and mitigate the uh, various impacts of COVID-19. We are now into uh, the fourth month, actually, uh, of the crisis. And many countries have suffered from lockdowns, large-scale social restrictions, which clearly have really had an impact on both not just the public health sector, but also on the social economic lives of people around the world. And, and we have to raise, to meet the challenge. Well, while we talk about the need for cooperation, we also realize that in overcoming the pandemic, each country has been forced to come to meet the, uh, the, the challenges through their own resources, you know, because uh, the lifeline of globalization, the lifeline of international cooperation have been disrupted because we have to disrupt transportations, uh, uh, trade, tourism, and you know, normal social lives have been uh, disrupted. So how can we overcome this? And in, you know, in what way we, can we uh, uh, develop both cooperation at the same time and at the same time also try to mitigate the uh, spread of the virus? Uh, in the long term, while strengthening our individual national resources. Uh, for uh, the speakers today, we have three distinguished ambassadors. Uh, I will just briefly uh, read out the names of the three speakers, and then we also have a lineup of very distinguished discussions. Uh, the three speakers today are His Excellency uh, Kung Po, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN uh, from Cambodia. Uh, His Excellency Deng Zijun, the Ambassador of China to ASEAN. And His Excellency Jose Tafares, the Director General of ASEAN Cooperation from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. So, and for the discussions, we have uh, discussions from all over the ASEAN region and uh, uh, China also. And, uh, I will mention that there are 15 num names here. The first is Dr. N. Paraniteran. I'm sorry if I mangle your name. It's country representative of WHO uh, in Indonesia. Uh, second is Tan Sri, Dr. Jamila Mahmud, special advisor to the prime minister of Malaysia on public health and former USG at IVRC in Geneva. I think our uh, camera is a bit slow in connecting the name with, 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 with the face. Uh, Dr. Vanari Cheng, President of the Asian Vision Institute and Chairman of the Advisory Council of the National Assembly of Cambodia. Dr. Hadi Kunchara, Executive Director of the Habibi Center. 
Dr. Dina Prapto Raharja, uh, China Policy Group. Good morning, Pak, uh, Pak Hadi Kuncara. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dina Prapto Raharja, China Policy Group. Uh, Dina. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sopan Albana is going to be late because his neighbor passed away. Then we have Dr. Dato Abdul Majid Ahmad Khan, adjunct professor from the Institute of China Studies, University of Malaya. Good morning, Dato. Dr. Dafri Agus Salim, director of ASEAN Studies Center at Universitas Gajah Mada, Yogyakarta. Where's Dr. Where's Dr. Dafri? Okay, Pak Dafri, good morning. Uh, Dr. Jayan Menon, visiting senior fellow from ISIS Singapore. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Pak Jayan. Then Dr. Zhang Ji, research and head of security at the Foreign Affairs Department uh, from CAS, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Yang Yu, Associate Professor and Deputy Director, Institute of Asian Studies, China Foreign Affairs. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Dr. Tang Tipang, Associate Research Fellow, the Department for International and Strategic Studies at China Institute for International Affairs. Are you there? Dr. Tang Tipang? No, we, we don't have visual yet. Ms. Lydia Rudy, Economic Research Institute of, for us. Oh, yeah, okay, Ms. Lydia, and you are at area in Jakarta. Dr. Henry Chang, visiting research professor at uh, Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace. Welcome. And uh, Ms. Uh, Irene Chan from RSIS in Singapore. Is that Irene? Okay, yeah, good morning. So without further ado, uh, I will give the floor to uh, Ambassador Kung Pork, who is uh, Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN and he has a very illustrious career uh, in the Cambodian Foreign Ministry. He served as a uh, deputy, currently Deputy Secretary General for uh, at ASEAN on Social Cultural Community from 2018 to 2021. Prior to that, uh, he was Under Secretary, uh, the State of Office of the Council of Ministers of the Royal Government in Cambodia, co-founder of the uh, Cambodian Strategic Study Group, uh, and you know the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, His Excellency Deng Zijun, Chinese Ambassador to ASEAN. Uh, His Excellency Noel Servigon, Permanent Representative of the Philippines to ASEAN. His Excellency Jose Tavares, Director General of ASEAN Cooperation, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. Uh, Excellencies, members of the Committee of Permanent Representative and all the uh, discussions, distinguished speakers. A very good morning again. Uh, allow me to uh, first express you know, my condolences and uh, sympathies to the People's Republic of China and the rest of ASEAN uh, member states that are cur currently affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. I would also like to express my appreciation to the permanent mission of the Philippines and the Chinese mission to ASEAN for co-sponsoring the first Jakarta Forum for 2020 under the themes of ASEAN-China cooperation in combating COVID-19 pandemic. Based on the situation report of WHO and the ASEAN Biodiaspora Virtual Center issues on 28 May uh, 2020, there are currently more than 84,000 confirmed cases and 2,600 deaths reported in ASEAN. The epidemic situation in China has improved in spite of its more than 84,500 cases and 4,600 deaths. Given ASEAN's central and important role in global movements of trade, travel, social exchanges, and health-related initiatives, the impact of this pandemic has certainly caused havoc that is incomparable to what we have experienced so far in this century. It is timely that we have this forum at this period of the pandemic, where in countries and regions globally are in different phases of responses to the impacts of COVID-19. In February 2020, uh, COVID-19 was only declared by the World Health Organization as a public health emergency of global concern. And there were only six ASEAN member states with confirmed cases at the times in the regions. But within the span of three months, this unprecedented crisis rapidly unfolded. COVID-19 has been declared a global pandemic by the WHO on 11 March 2020. 
Now there are no single ASEAN member state which have been spared from this pandemic. Similar to the situation in China, other regions and other countries globally, the pandemic has severely impacted ASEAN member state public health and their economies, especially in the trade services, tourism and travel sector. ASEAN has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic in a timely and cohesive manner by undertaking measure at the bilateral and regional level to sustain a healthy, resilient and united ASEAN community. This timely response was also made possible with the strengthened cooperation of ASEAN and China in addressing the multifactorial and multi-sectoral effects of this pandemic in the region. The ASEAN health sector at national and regional level responded immediately to the outbreak as early as the first week of January 2020, when China SOMHD and their health counterpart shared the first report of the cluster of pneumonia cases due to this novel coronavirus to the ASEAN Secretariat. The ASEAN health sector responded through its public health emergency mechanisms by mobilizing the ASEAN Emergency Operation Center Network for Public Health Emergencies, ASEAN Biodiaspora Virtual Center for Big Data Analytics and Visualizations, ASEAN Risk Assessment and Risk Communication Centers, and the network of regional public health laboratory, disease surveillance, and health expert on communicable diseases. The ASEAN China Health Cooperation Platforms and mechanism for sharing timely and transparent information and technical exchanges will likewise mobilize and sustain until this day. Following the participation of China Health Focal Points at the ASEAN Plus 3 SOMHD Special Video Conference and following the ASEAN China Foreign Minister Special Meetings on COVID-19 in February 2020, China has provided regional and bilateral support to several ASEAN member states. This include, among others, the regular sharing of technical information, guidelines and protocol for the detection and treatment of COVID-19. The provision of medical supplies such as protective personal equipment and test kit and technical changes among health experts. This type of cooperation provided through the China Health Colleague have been value, uh, valuably uh, utilized by health counterparts in ASEAN. At a higher level within the ASEAN health sector, the China health sector supported the commitment in the joint statement on enhancing cooperation in COVID-19 response, together with health minister from other plus three countries and ASEAN member state on 7 April 2020. Excellency, distinguished representative. As COVID-19 continues to seize our regional agenda, our leaders have reaffirmed the commitment in the fight against COVID-19 and in strengthening the coordination of national and regional efforts in ensuring ASEAN readiness and response responsive measure to mitigate and eliminate the threat of COVID-19. To follow up on this commitment, the ASEAN Coordinating Council agreed to set up the ACC Working Group on Public Health Emergency, WGPHE. Subsequently, on 31st March 2020, the ACCWG on PHE met, led by the senior official meeting chair and involving relevant sectoral body from across three pillars, including the sectors of health, foreign affairs, information, defense, immigration and finance. A set of recommendations were put up to mitigate the far-reaching adverse impact of COVID-19 in all aspects of life and later approved by the ACC. At the special ASEAN Plus 3 Summit on COVID-19 on 14 April 2020, the China leader together with the rest of the leaders of ASEAN and other Plus 3 countries reaffirmed the commitment to strengthen solidarity and hand cooperation and mutual support among the ASEAN Plus 3 countries to control and contain the spread of the pandemic and address its adverse impact on our societies and economies. ASEAN response to the pandemic can only be more effective if done in partnership with relevant sectors within ASEAN and with development and dialogue partners such as China. With regard to the ASEAN-China cooperation, we are heartened with the further commitment announced by Premier Li Keqiang to support ASEAN initiative on regional response pool fund and other health-related engagement on COVID-19. In the context of the global support uh, of China to address COVID-19, ASEAN region will certainly benefit from uh, China's strong steps in supporting key areas in prevention, quarantine, detection, treatment, tracing, and research and development on vaccine. Increasing political and financial support to the WHO and other regional health institutions and agencies supporting countries and region in resource poor settings and strengthening solidarity in mitigating the impact of this pandemic 
in the context of addressing other threats to avoid or prevent complex disasters from happening again in the future. It is heartwarming that in this difficult time, we have been able to showcase our spirit of solidarities and be part of the global effort in navigating this crisis. Guided by our leaders, as soon we attack all the challenges collectively to limit loss of life, productivity and livelihood, support post-pandemic recovery efforts, especially in the most affected sector, such as health and trade, and strengthen supply chain resilient again future shock. ASEAN look forward to sustain this objective in collaboration with China and other external partners. I wish this forum a great success. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kung for, uh, for that uh, uh, excellent presentation and, and that uh, heartening endorsement of the uh, strength of cooperation between ASEAN uh, and China. I'm sure that we'll have further discussion about this, whether, you know, whether uh, in what areas we can improve our uh, cooperation further. But now I would like to invite uh, His Excellency Deng Zhijun, uh, the ambassador of China to ASEAN. Uh, former, formerly, uh, Ambassador Deng was special envoy uh, on the Afghan affairs from, from 2015 to 2020. He's also been an ambassador to Afghanistan from 2013 and 2015 and has also served in India as Minister Counselor from 2011 to 2013. Uh, so is very, very well informed uh, in uh, Asia, but now uh, he's ambassador to ASEAN uh, and uh, I will give you the floor for 15 minutes. Thank you. Excellency Deputy Secretary General Kung Fu, Excellency Direct General Jose Tavares, Excellency Ambassador Noel and other permanent representatives of ASEAN countries. Excellency Dr. Dino Jalal, dear professors and friends, good morning. I'm happy to see you again via video link and I welcome all of you to the first Jakarta Forum in 2020. As Ambassador Noel rightly recalled, five Jakarta Forum have been held since its inception last year. The inspiring exchanges have contributed fresh wisdom to cooperation between China and ASEAN and in East Asia as a whole. Nothing else tops the agenda of regional cooperation today than the need to defeat COVID-19, uphold stability and restore growth to our region. We are meeting at a time when China and ASEAN have had very productive cooperation against the virus. This has made our workshop all the more relevant as we will review successful experience, address deficiencies, and explore ways of deepening cooperation to take our region out of crisis. As close neighbors connected by mountains and rivers, China and ASEAN countries enjoy the fine tradition of mutual assistance in times of difficulties. Since the beginning of our dialogue relations in 1991, we have worked together to turn the tide over major crises, such as the Asian and international financial crisis, the SARS and the avian influenza. We have offered each other enormous help and support in devastating natural disasters, such as the Indian Ocean tsunami and the Wenchuan earthquake. Each crisis has led to closer ties and a stronger cooperation between us and demonstrated our extraordinary friendship and deep mutual trust. Our valuable experience of jointly tackling crisis and the mechanisms for enhancing emergency preparedness have drawn us closer to each other as neighbors and partners. The pandemic has been raging globally with escalating impact, which has gravely threatened the life and health of the Chinese and ASEAN people. This common challenge once again reveals the interconnectedness of China and ASEAN. In response, our two sides have extended each other mutual support and conducted close cooperation. 
our solidarity and coordination are moving us toward a stronger China ASEAN community with a shared future. In this regard, I wish to highlight some of our collective endeavors. First, policy and technology communication has been intensified. President Xi Jinping, Premier Li Keqiang, and the State Councilor and the Foreign Minister Wang Yi talk frequently over phone with their ASEAN counterparts. The health authorities of both sides have maintained hotline exchanges of the latest developments and information. In addition to China's public, publicly released uh, pro protocols of diagnosis, treatment, and contact, Chi Chinese health experts have also shared first-hand experience with their ASEAN colleagues through a dozen of video meetings. China has also sent eight medical expert teams to Cambodia, Laos, the Philippines, Myanmar, and the Malaysia, and help the Philippines and the Myanmar set up testing labs to enhance the response cap capability of ASEAN. Second, mutual assistance has been extended when they are most needed. Ever since China's first report, China first reported cases to WHO, ASEAN countries and the ASEAN Secretariat have been standing side by side with China. The governments and the people of ASEAN countries extended sympathy and assistance to China. The grateful Chinese people take this heartwarming and precious support to heart. After the virus hit ASEAN, the Chinese central local governments, the military, the business community, and the private entities responded with no delay to reciprocate aids, acts of friendship and kindness from ASEAN. The urgently needed medical supplies have since been flowing uninterruptedly from China to ASEAN countries. Our mutual timely assistance and support have given each other strength and confidence to fight and win the battle. Third, consensus among countries in the region has been poor and anti-pandemic efforts better coordinated. China supports the ASEAN-centered mechanisms in playing an active role in protecting regional public health security through cooperation. In February, the ASEAN-China Special Foreign Ministers Meeting on COVID-19 was held. Close communication and coordination have maintained under the ASEAN Plus 3 APT mechanism. The APT health senior officials meeting, health ministers meeting, and the special summit was prepared and convened with no delay, setting a good example of anti-pandemic cooperation for the world. Our leaders reached important consensus at the special APT summit that strengthened the determination and the confidence of regional countries to defeat the virus with a collective response and vital, revitalize the regional economy. Fourth, business ties have been tightened. China ASEAN trade remains resilient despite the COVID-19. China's General Administration of Customs reported a 6.1% percent growth of China ASEAN trade in goods in the first quarter of this year to exceed 140 billion US dollars, making ASEAN China's largest trading partner for the first time. The Belt and the Road projects in ASEAN countries are advancing steadily, with major progress in the China Laos Railway, the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Rail, the East Coast Rail Link in Malaysia, and the Heng Yi Petrochemical Project in Brunei. As a key part of regional anti-pandemic cooperation, stronger China-ASEAN economic ties have stabilized the economy and protected the industrial and the supply chains of the region. Dear colleagues and friends, confronted by the unexpected pandemic, the Chinese government has taken the most comprehensive, stringent, and thorough measures of prevention and control. 
it has followed a people-centered principle and take a sign-based and a targeted approach. China has acted with openness, transparency, and a responsibility to provide information to WHO and the relevant countries in the mo most timely fashion. We have released the genetic sequence at the earliest possible time and sh shared control and treatment experience with the world without reservation. We have provided countries in need with meaningful support and assistance. What China did has proved to be effective and our opposition to labeling, stigmatization, and the politicization of the virus has been widely acclaimed by the international community. The fair and just evolution of China's anti-pandemic efforts will eventually emerge from history. After making painstaking efforts and enormous sacrifice, China has made significant strategic results and is one of the first countries to bring the pandemic under control. China's restoration of economic and social de development has greatly eased the global shortage of medical supplies and will contribute to the recovery of global economy at an early date. At the two sessions, the two big conferences of China just concluded, many important decisions were made which would not have been possible without China's successful anti-pandemic efforts. Going forward, China will work on an ongoing basis to contain the virus and the force, force the, a resurgence of infection. And in meantime, reopen business at a faster pace. China will step up international cooperation and the coordination to stabilize global industrial and supply chains and restore growth in the world economy. China is also happy to see that the control measures in ASEAN is producing good results and that ASEAN has turned out to be in a better shape than other regions in the world. This is attributable to the hard work of ASEAN governments and the people. China commends the governments of ASEAN countries for implementing timely stringent control measures and economic stimulus policies. We also appreciate the leadership of Vietnam as ASEAN chair for strengthening ASEAN unity and the coordination against COVID-19. Recently, the situation in ASEAN countries is better off on the whole with rising recovery rates and no new transmissions for days in nearly half of its member states. This improvement has laid a solid foundation for the gradual resumption of economic and social development in ASEAN. Dear colleagues and friends, as the virus is still raging, the global fight against COVID-19 is at a critical moment. As President Xi Jinping proposed at the opening of the World Health Assembly recently, we must defeat the virus through solidarity and cooperation, protect the life and the health of people in all countries, safeguard planet Earth, our common home, and build a global community of health for all. China is ready to further strengthen coordination and cooperation with ASEAN, achieve the final victory and the global recovery and build a closer China-ASEAN community with a shared future. To this end, I wish to make the following proposals. First, we need to enhance joint prevention and control to curb the spread of the virus in the region. We must strengthen coordination between our com competent authorities so that they could better share information, exchange control measures, treatment experience, and research outcomes in a timely fashion and conduct joint research and development of drugs and the vaccine. We also need to have more dialogues and cooperation in health by summing up experience and addressing deficiencies. China will continue to do everything 
in its power to support and assist ASEAN in light of ASEAN's needs. Second, in view of longer term needs, we need to put in place more cooperation mechanisms. We must strengthen institution building in public health, such as China ASEAN Public Health Emergency Liaison Mechanism, China ASEAN and APT reserves of essential medical supplies, as well as tabletop exercises for public health emergencies. We need to make better use of China ASEAN Cooperation Fund to finance more health projects and train more emergency response professionals in public health. Third, we need to uphold multilateralism and improve global public health governance. It's important to strengthen the UN-centered governance system for public health security, enhance coordination and cooperation with WHO and increase critical and financial support for WHO so that it could play a bigger role in leading global efforts against COVID-19. Since the outbreak, China has donated 50 million US dollars and enormous supplies to WHO. China will also work with the UN to set up a global humanitarian response depot and hub in China. President Xi committed at the World Health Assembly two billion US dollars over the next two years to help, cope, to help with COVID-19 response and with economic and social development in affected countries. ASEAN countries are of course to benefit. Fourth, we need to enhance policy coordination to restore growth of the region. We must jointly take necessary measures to stabilize the global industrial and the supply chains, conclude RCEP by the end of this year and bring East Asia back to the growth track. With all the necessary control measures in place, we should consider opening a fast track lane for essential personnel on urgent visits in the areas of commerce, logistics, production, and technological services. China has implemented this arrangement with the Republic of Korea and is discussing this idea with Singapore. In view, in view of the post-pandemic era, we must advance cooperation in e-commerce, health and medical care, smart manufacturing, big data, and 5G to foster new drivers of growth. Dear colleagues, colleagues and friends, to conclude, I'm convinced that with the strong leadership of Chinese and ASEAN leaders, with the solidarity and the cooperation among countries in our region, we will prevail over the virus at an early date. As State Councillor and the Foreign Minister Wang Yi put, put in at his press conference a few days ago, rainbow will appear after storm. China will continue to view ASEAN as a high priority in its neighborhood diplomacy and support ASEAN centrality in East Asia cooperation. China is ready to move our relations forward in the spirit of mutual trust, mutual accommodation, mutual benefit, and mutual assistance. Next year will mark the 30th anniversary of China ASEAN dialogue relations. We believe that with the mature, maturity and the confidence our relationship has gained in the past three decades. China and ASEAN will take more solid steps forward in forging a closer community with a shared future. Let's make concerted efforts to deepen cooperation against the pandemic. Let's build a closer China-ASEAN community with a shared future. And let's take China-ASEAN relations to new heights. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Deng, uh, for that very uh, illuminating and very comprehensive uh, discussions about 
uh, what China has been doing and also the, uh, the very strong cooperation between ASEAN and China. One of the most important uh, remark that you made is actually that from every crisis, our relations, countries have grown stronger and also the relations between ASEAN and China have also grown stronger. So crises have tested us, it either makes us or it makes us stronger. And, uh, and in your presentation, you've uh, very convincingly uh, 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 given uh, very uh, convincing. Um, I'm not hearing you, Professor Dewi. Yes, uh, for the next speaker, I think we can move on to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Jose Tavares. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Dewi Fortuna Anwar for moderating uh, today's virtual uh, forum. Uh, I'd like to extend my appreciation to my friend, uh, Dino Pati Jalal, for inviting me to share my views on this very important team, ASEAN-China cooperation in dealing with the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, distinguished ambassadors, uh, permanent representatives, uh, colleagues, uh, discussants. Uh, the Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN, uh, Kumpoak, and uh, Ambassador Dan Siswan, as well as Ambassador Noel, uh, have uh, extensively elaborated uh, on the cooperation between ASEAN uh, and China uh, in dealing with COVID-19. So everything has been said already. So I, I wish to add uh, a few points uh, that ASEAN and China have a strong cooperation uh, uh, strong engagement uh, to jointly address the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, since the very beginning. A uh, number of virtual meetings and consultations has already been alluded to uh, by uh, the previous speakers. Uh, and I just uh, want to mention a few things. Uh, for example, the special ASEAN-China foreign ministers meeting on COVID-19 held on 20, uh, 20th February in Vientiane and follow up by the special video conference on ASEAN China health experts on the same day, actually, uh, step up cooperation in the region against COVID-19 by sharing information, strengthen cooperation in risk communication and community engagement, readiness and response, strengthen policy dialogue and exchanges on the latest development of COVID-19, including control and treatment, ASEAN and China continue to strengthen our cooperation to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic, including uh, in the socioeconomic uh, aspect, uh, exchange of real-time information, best practices and experiences, assisting one another uh, where we can with uh, food and medical supplies. As besides ASEAN and China, there is also ASEAN uh, plus three cooperation that, uh, of course, China is is uh, part of, uh, and we have uh, as well a, a number of uh, virtual uh, meetings, uh, ASEAN plus three special summit on the 14th of April, uh, ASEAN plus three health ministers meeting uh, uh, on the 7th of April and a special video conference on ASEAN plus three senior officials health development. Uh, so. I would like to, I don't want to repeat what they have said, otherwise uh, colleagues will be really bored of this. Now, now I want to say that regionally, in generally ASEAN member states, uh, we talk about ASEAN member states and as well as ASEAN and DALEC partners, ASEAN member states are collaborating and assisting one another in the provision of essential medical supplies and equipment. Uh, easing the regulations, uh, we have committed to easing the regulations uh, for those essential supplies and gradually to ensure continued flows of, of those uh, uh, essential goods. Mutual assistance uh, to ASEAN nationals uh, in ASEAN uh, region, as well as in third countries, we have uh, guidelines established for that. And it is ASEAN is helping one, one another, uh, including the migrant workers. Uh, we have uh, in the context of ASEAN plus three, we have the ASEAN plus three emergency rice reserve. Right now we have 778 
thousand uh, uh, tons of uh, metric cubic tons of rice of rice standby uh, standby to be ready to be used if, in case uh, necessary in case it's demanded by ASEAN plus three uh, members countries and there is also standby uh, Chiang Mai initiative multilateralization so because of the COVID-19 have a vast uh, ramification, vast impact on various uh, uh, livelihood, economic, social economic aspects of, of uh, people in the region. The Chiang Mai Initiative uh, multilateralization, in fact, have 250 billion uh, uh, US dollars ready to assist uh, uh, member states in any case uh, it's needed. So all of these are in place. And ASEAN also, as a result of our uh, engagement with China, with the ASEAN plus three countries, and with, with other dialogue partners, uh, uh, we have uh, established, uh, for example, we are in the process of establishing a regional reserve, regional reserve for medical supplies, finalizing the establishment of COVID-19 ASEAN response fund, establishing an ASEAN center for disease control and prevention, and also, as I mentioned before, reserve of essential medical supplies and includes a warehouse to be managed by the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance. Now, ASEAN is mobilizing collaboration and support from partners around the world. Uh, hotline communication among health experts, sharing best practices. Uh, for example, uh, I mean, we are talking about uh, ASEAN and China that has already provided a lot of assistance and, and uh, to, towards one another and as well as uh, we have for example the European Union as well as uh, is, is uh, offering uh, uh, support to ASEAN with 350 uh, million uh, euros and also Japan is supporting the establishment of ASEAN Center for Disease and Prevention Control the CDC uh, in ASEAN uh, region. ASEAN plus three for example is, is supporting the establishment of ASEAN COVID-19 response fund. That's already been mentioned uh, by uh, Ambassador Ten. And uh, also, as, as already been mentioned also, we are exploring the possibility of a joint production, joint production in uh, medicines and vaccines when it is found. So Indonesia, in this case, is also ready for the joint production. Uh, in order to have this uh, production of medicine or, or vaccines uh, massively, I guess, because it's global, uh, so that it can be affordable and accessible by all of the citizens uh, in our region and beyond. So Indonesia alone, uh, let me tell you that Indonesia alone has garnered about 111 supports. Uh, these uh, including uh, from governments, uh, from 88 non-governmental organizations and 12 uh, uh, international organizations. Uh, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Indonesia, Ibu Retno Marsud, is very active in mobilizing this uh, collaboration, global collaboration and uh, support uh, towards one another. And for Indonesia alone, actually, there is a, a support of uh, around nearly 100 million US dollars at this point in time. So, so now things are still uh, uh, moving forward. Now, I hope that I still, I, I don't want to touch anymore on this uh, uh, issue uh, because it's already been uh, too many speakers spoken about uh, our collaboration that is very rich and we are very thankful for our partner, China, for actively and continue to be active and continue to be committed to enhance our, our uh, cooperation forward. I think the ambassador of China, Ambassador Dan, that has mentioned a uh, uh, few points uh, as a suggestion for our future co collaboration, I think is, is excellent. And we are going to work together to explore, to concretize what has been uh, said by the ambassador. Uh, there are possible scenarios, the way I see it forward. Now, th there are uh, one possible scenario is that uh, uh, the best, this is the best case scenario is that scientists will, found, will find uh, a vaccine or medicine this year, in a few months time, they will find a vaccine or medicine that hopefully will be accessible to all countries and affordable. So the key is that we can put the COVID-19 under control. 
So all of the plans that we have done before in the previous years, uh, without thinking of, of this unprecedented uh, 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 pandemic, can run as we think. But some said it is not possible. So even though we have this best, best uh, case scenario, how fast we will recover? Uh, as we have seen uh, here already, uh, the Deputy Secretary General saying that the uh, ASEAN region has, has been impacted uh, uh, heavily on uh, tourism, investment, uh, uh, even trade, even though the Master of, Science, of China said that uh, there is an increasing uh, growth of trade by 6.1%, which is, this is really amazing. Uh, I mean, hopefully this will continue, but how fast we will we'll recover? It will depend, of course, very much on how fast the workers are re-employed, how rapidly consume consumption and demand return, and so that there will be uh, fast investment. Uh, investment will, will again pick up. Now, the question is how normal it will be under this best case scenario. Now, some say that it will never be the same again. Even the, the vaccine will be found uh, in a few man, months time this year. Uh, it will take months, even uh, years to produce massively and to make it uh, readily available to all countries. Many people will continue to, work, to be out of, of work. Consumption uh, of many products will be significantly low uh, as a consequence of the low demand and not uh, uh, and the production, of course, will be stagnant as a result. And people uh, want to invest, but they have to wait and see of the situation. So this is the, the best case scenario. So I guess the new normal, uh, even in the best case scenario, will continue to be applied and see how long it will uh, it will uh, affect uh, or will recover from from this situation. Now the second scenario that I see is the worst case scenario, is that there is no vaccine or medicine found until next year, and it can be a second or third wave. God willing, this is not going to happen, but there is a great possibility. Uh, looking at people are coming uh, together again and, and in various countries, uh, then countries will continue to undertake massive testing. Those infected with, of the virus will be put under quarantine, uh, we have to apply stricter uh, protocols and social distancing, and we have to actually mapping out which, which are the green area, yellow area, or red, red zone. Uh, I mean, uh, so when we are going to have all of our economy be recovered, it very much depend uh, on how fast uh, we are going to put under control under control this, this uh, uh, coronavirus. Now, I may see that uh, for the future, I guess we are moving ASEAN region to, uh, not only ASEAN, I guess, we'll be moving to a more uh, digital society, virtual meetings, more teleconferences, like what we have now, video conferences. Many will be continue working from home. We'll be applying more flexi working space and flexi time system. And uh, ASEAN, I guess, will be moving, moving faster. I think this, this kind of situation will boost a digital economy in ASEAN. So e-commerce will be further expanded, online marketing, e-promotion, ASEAN single window. So eventually we'll becoming less social beings and becoming more digital beings. I would rather stop here because I think everything has been covered uh, on, the, on the theme of ASEAN and China cooperation dealing with COVID. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ba Jose. My uh, sincere apology for uh, disappearing shortly while, while introducing Ba Jose because Wi-Fi problem. And um, on, on the note that we are going to become less social being and more digital being, uh, that so be uh, the new normal. There'll probably not, it will not be between best case scenario or worst case scenario, but it'll be in the middle where we really will probably uh, uh, a real transformation of our society and our economy, and there'll be winners and losers. 
uh, in this. Um, I would, uh, I've already uh, uh, reminded of the discussions earlier that you need to raise your hand uh, for uh, coming in the interventions. And I already have, we have 80 minutes for discussions and I already have three uh, interventions. Uh, Dr. Jamila, special advisor to Malaysian uh, uh, prime minister, and then Dr. Parani from WHO, and then Dr. Dina. So Dr. Jamila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was really delighted to be able to participate today, and I just want to thank the previous speakers for very, very good interventions. And I'd like to build on a couple of them. The first thing I will say is that ASEAN has an amazing opportunity and a, a really a well place to be a fantastic convening power. And we've seen this in many situations. China has been very generous in uh, its um, re relationships with many of the ASEAN countries, including Malaysia, and we're very grateful for that. But I would like to take the goodwill further. How do we turn the goodwill, the ASEAN plus three uh, discussions further into very pragmatic steps on how we move forward? The first thing is that we are going to have to learn to live with COVID. Uh, and that you know, until a virus is found, uh, sorry, a vaccine is found, uh, we really have to uh, have a complete mindset shift on how we uh, live and how we work. And therefore, the comments from the previous speaker, uh, Ambassador Tavares, was really quite, really spot on. But I also think that uh, we need to look at the community because in managing a pandemic, it's very good to have governments having strong policies, regional organizations having strong cooperation and broader frameworks. But at the end of the day, in the, ends of, in the absence of a virus, it really is people, the citizens, taking precautions, managing the physical distance, you know, hand hygiene, you know, respiratory hygiene. It sounds very trivial, but this is the only vaccine we have right now. Now, in terms of pragmatically moving forward with all the goodwill, I don't think we should reinvent the wheel. Uh, what we would be really good is to see how do you build on existing mechanisms that ASEAN already has and that works really well. And this is particularly around disaster management, as mentioned by Ambassador Deng. Managing a pandemic in terms of response, recovery, data management, visualization, analysis, and, and, and also preparedness, is very similar whether you're managing a cyclone or whether you're man managing a pandemic. And I think this is an opportunity to look at what tools are readily available. For example, the disaster logistics uh, hubs that ASEAN has are very, very good uh, you know, starting points to ensure that logistic supplies are there for distribution in ASEAN. And I know this has happened sporadically, but perhaps this should be systematized in other words, I'm calling for a much more systems approach to looking at management of pandemics because we know this is not going to be the last one. The second thing I would say is that, you know, how do you strengthen um, the research that's going on? Uh, WHO, as, you, as we are all aware, is you know, doing a lot more collaborative uh, research as well as looking for a vaccine. China has done some uh, quite uh, fast work, I would say, in vaccine production. Um, vaccine research and has moved to stage two in some of the vaccine trials. How does ASEAN as a bloc uh, form a much stronger ne negotiating uh, power bloc in terms of access to vaccines? Because we all know when vaccines are available, there will be a competition on who gets the vaccine. And it's extremely important that everyone has access to vaccines. And I think ASEAN as a bloc can actually do that to, to really weigh in on access to vaccines. The third, I would say, is that, you know, strengthen your civil societies. China's Red Cross has been very critical in sharing best practices with many Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world, including Italian Red Cross. Uh, and I think that, you know, we have to also learn from the civil society in China that has worked quite closely and the Red Cross being a statutory body you know, is one very good example of how you can actually bring community learning and community engagement uh, at all levels in ASEAN. And, and I also say that uh, it's extremely important for us to address the sticky issues. 
we have real issues with refugees coming in uh, to our borders. Earlier on, you know, it was discussed about, you know, the Andaman crisis of, of uh, refugees who aren't received in many countries. And it's a real, really difficult catch-22 situation for many governments because uh, there's a protection of their borders on one hand, and then there's a humanitarian crisis uh, on the other hand. So I would say that uh, we need to address these. Uh, ASEAN needs to convene and discuss how does it manage not just refugees, but undocumented migrants who all need to have some access to healthcare, have also a right to be protected. And what is the long-term solution? So I think that, you know, this is a fantastic starting place. Can we also have a much more um, uh, learning uh, attitude in the ASEAN Plus uh, in that how do we get and learn from this pandemic? How do we build in anticipation and forecasting in future so that the systems that we have to develop within ASEAN as a membership organization as well as individual ASEAN countries can be uh, can be improved. So I will pause there and just say thank you very much again. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here and it's very exciting. Over to you. Thank you, Ibu. Now I would like to uh, your point about it's not just the government, if this is a whole government and whole society efforts. And, uh, and here in this case, uh, some societies, and clearly uh, Indonesia is a case where we are a very, you know, it's a democratic and openings and also during Ramadan where people want to travel and want to visit their relatives, uh, no matter how strong the enforcement, uh, it's very difficult to police all of the mosques and very difficult to, to prevent people from traveling, wanting to visit their relatives. Uh, they are not afraid, you know, uh, of a virus. So this is, this is, this is a challenge. And also uh, uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, the challenges is, this is both economics and, and religious. Uh, for the economics one, in many, many cases, uh, those who have lost their jobs and those who do not have regular income, you know, they feel that they have no choice either to die of virus or to die of starvation. Uh, uh, this is a challenge that also, you know, we, we need to address how, how do ASEAN countries deal with this, where like in Indonesia, the large, the large sector of our economy is actually in the informal sector, people do not have regular job. Uh, and then the religious factors where they feel that, you know, uh, do, do so to, the, to the faith, they, uh, they, they want to congregate in mosques, in churches and, and so on, and, and they are less afraid of the state uh, uh, in this case. Um, but uh, so I hope somebody will follow the, 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 the issues later on as well, uh, the, the issues of uh, the economic imperatives, the short term imperatives versus public health imperative. Now I'd like uh, to invite uh, Ruta Parani. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Devi. Uh, good morning, colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and thank you for Foreign Policy Community Indonesia for organizing such an important topic for this Jakarta Forum. Um, uh, one thing I want to say at the outset is that um, I think it's, it's not about what we are learning for the next pandemic. Uh, I think what is important is what we are learning for this pandemic, uh, because this is only the beginning and we still have a long way to go. And we are building the ship as we sail. And, and, and that's a very unique feature in, in this whole pandemic response globally. Thank you for the presenters for, for framing the discussion and, and Dr. Jamila for the excellent points. Uh, let me build up on two points that, that have come up here. Uh, one is when we talk about uh, ASEAN cooperation, supplies and others you have discussed and covered well. I want to take it to the next level. Uh, see, one of the problems that we faced in this pandemic is that normally you have a tsunami or another emergency. It affects a few countries in a region or globally in a few countries or a region. We managed to bring surge and additional capacity from other parts of the world and manage to mount uh, an appropriate response. This pandemic now affects almost all the countries. There's very little surge capacity available from one country to go and support another country at all. So countries are struggling with that. Now, can ASEAN and ASEAN 3 plus say, within this pandemic, one country may have a transmission going up, another country may have bent the curve or flattened the curve. During those intervals, country that has managed it well, 
say, in another country that is struggling with the overwhelming load and cannot manage the laboratory capacity or the testing capacity, can one country consider sending your lab personnel and system to this other country for a few months and help them manage it, right? So think about a little more of that because lab, and, and, and there's a particular reason I took the lab example, because laboratory testing is a fundamental cornerstone of the response for this pandemic. And this is what a lot of countries are struggling with. So within ASEAN, that might be something that will be a big help. Of course, all the other best practices, sharing information and others will also help. In addition to that, think a bit specific, something like that. Or if a country has used a very good contact tracing app, and maybe that can be uh, exported to another country and to be able to apply for the context and use it. So I think that'll be a fantastic area and, and a very real timely help for, for another ASEAN country or even ASEAN to other countries in the world. Uh, a second point, we have talked a lot about uh, vaccines and treatments. So today at 5 p.m. in Geneva time, uh, Costa Rica government and WHO is launching a solidarity call to action. Uh, and it is co-sponsored by a number of countries, including uh, at least as of two days back, we have Malaysia and Indonesia as two ASEAN countries who are co-sponsoring this solidarity call to action. And the basic idea is to launch a platform where, as, as Dr. Jamila mentioned as well, is this, this whole notion, and there's a lot of nervousness around, if there's a new treatment that is proven to be very effective, are we all going to get our equal share? Or if there's a new vaccine, are we going to get our equal share? This is a concern for almost all the policymakers worldwide. So what this platform does is it's making any new therapeutics, diagnostics or vaccines as a global public goods so that it will be equitably shared for all people of all countries. And how can we make more of them quickly to be able to share with everybody rather than it becomes a competition? And that's what this whole solidarity call to action is about. Uh, and, and I think it, it, it's an important uh, initiative for everybody to work together, ASEAN, ASEAN plus three and others to work together to support so that we can, we can reduce that tension. And that creates a lot of unhealthy uh, conflicts uh, among countries uh, eventually and, and, and unnecessary tension politically as well. Uh, so this is, this is another relevant initiative to share the vaccines and treatments and others. Uh, and and I, I would like to be an optimist on a, on a best case scenario, Ambassador Jose Tavares presented that we will have a vaccine in a few months. Unfortunately, Ambassador, uh, being a realist, I think it's going to take at least a year or more uh, until we have a reliable vaccine. So we have to learn to live with this new normal. And, and as Dr. Jamila advised to follow all those public health measures and social measures um, to be able to keep it under control until we have a proper treatment and a vaccine. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parani. Uh, hopefully, the, um, the, the three officials later on will also be able uh, to come back uh, and, uh, and address some of the issues that have been raised by uh, Ibu Jamila and also uh, Dr. Parani. Uh, when, when you talk, can we walk the walk, you know, in terms of after talking the talk? It's easy to talk about cooperation, about sharing vaccine, about uh, uh, collaboration, when at the end of the day, it's during the crisis, it's me first, you know, every, every country for itself. And, and the point made by Dr. Parani that during the tsunami, it's in Aceh. The whole of the Indonesian government is still in place and is able to mobilize and the whole world is able to come very, very quickly uh, to assist. But here now, the, uh, actually the developed countries, the United States is the worst uh, affected. Uh, European Union is in, in disarray, even after, you know, on top of Brexit, uh, we could see that uh, Italy and Spain, you know, they had to manage on their own in the, in the beginning. Uh, and it's still very much uh, national capacity. And uh, I hope that uh, some of the uh, uh, discussions who are, I, are experts, you know, can reflect on, on, on these issues. Also, when we talk about, uh, on the one hand, the global pandemic, it's global, uh, it's transnational. And, and of course, we'll say, you know, the only way to go forward will be to work together because no single country will be able uh, to deal with this on, on their own. But at the same time, uh, it clearly, uh, it bears on us that 
when the pandemic came, we have to lock our borders. And not just like in Indonesia, locking the provinces, locking the kabupatens. So at the end of the day, in order to supply food, basic necessities, you cannot rely even on neighboring provinces. You know, this is a supply chain. It's not just about between countries, but also between islands, between provinces. So that means that how do you develop national capacity, local capacity? And how, you know, how do they, how do we align with international cooperation and de developing this, this uh, 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 autonomy uh, uh, for survival uh, in, the, in the new normal uh, era? So now I would like to call on Ibu Dina, uh, Dr. Uh, Dina. Uh, yeah, okay. Silakan. Okay. Good morning, Professor Dewi, uh, Excellency Kung Puok, Excellency Teng Shi Shun, Ni Hao and uh, Excellency Jose Tafares, uh, Pak Dino, Dr. Dino Patijala, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for the uh, very enlightening discussion this morning uh, and the assurances that the spirit of cooperation will always be advanced uh, between ASEAN and China. Uh, I think this is not just current period, but also post uh, COVID time will be very important. I would like to uh, highlight the point that was raised by the previous speaker. Uh, by Dr. Parani, who says that uh, no country has more uh, capacity than others. I think that's uh, mostly true for the uh, uh, health sector, but for the sector of economy, uh, we can talk about a different view, actually. Some countries still have uh, much higher capacity than others uh, to cope with this uh, COVID uh, difficulty and economic pressures. And I think one thing we cannot uh, escape I think, at least in my view, I cannot escape, uh, this cannot escape my attention, that uh, the background of this it was the, and still is, the trade war between China and the US. And I think in this kind of circumstance, if we look at the currency reserve of uh, countries around the world, uh, the US is still uh, badly affected and um, China is relatively much better than everybody else. So uh, in the short run, I think the US will still try to come after China surplus in trade balance. And this will somehow affect China options on what to import. You do uh, want to limit your uh, buying capacity as well. And there has been indication that China can drop buying products from some countries and some uh, economies are sent in sudden limbo because of that sudden change. So uh, my question to Ambassador uh, Tang Sijun and also to uh, ASEAN policy leaders here <laughs> is what does um, China and ASEAN plan to do to mitigate the worst consequence of this ongoing war? Uh, the limited buying capacity and yet you still have to maintain this cooperation between us. The second question is about the global value chain that uh, if you notice, a lot of the uh, manufacturing capacity in the world is now based in China, or at least um, the assembling uh, activity is in China. So uh, a lot of other countries, especially uh, in ASEAN, we rely a lot on uh, service sector, which is badly affected by this COVID. We cannot run, uh, we, at least we have yet uh, found the uh, new normal for this, uh, tourism, uh, trade in general, uh, people to people meeting, you know, it's, it's having uh, badly affected. So how do we ensure that manufacturing opportunity is also shared among this middle income countries? We uh, in ASEAN is among the uh, best uh, buying uh, purchasing power, community with purchasing power in the world. So we may not qualify uh, for a long run for uh, help, uh, global help in terms of economic help, but we do have the capacity to manufacture products. So the third point is very relevant to this. In ASEAN, you have uh, hosted activities uh, between businesses, business to business cooperation. And you notice that the statements from a WHO maybe uh, may send a different impact as well to the business communities. They adjusted quickly into creating a contract ba contract based uh, uh, cooperation yeah, uh, with, with their workers instead of uh, uh, a very clear uh, hiring uh, opportunity. They make it uh, so, so, so uncertain, the economy, that 
they, they should hire only on very short term basis. And so a lot of workers nowadays uh, in, in Indonesia, in ASEAN, is, uh, is in limbo. The government and especially the local governments is now sent to, uh, to think about what to do with the social protection because none of these people are uh, either uh, rich enough to take care of their own uh, self with that, that kind of short contract uh, work, uh, but they also, uh, they, they don't qualify necessarily as uh, poor people, but they are vulnerable people. So this is a new normal that we are going to face. And uh, I wish that ASEAN also engaged the business uh, to business community in this regard, so that the, this feeling of uncertainty doesn't actually uh, create a negative implications for how they recruit people in this region and thus affecting the entire vulnerability of the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dina. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, Ibu, we can hear you. Okay, right, yeah. Uh, uh, I would like to um, ask the ambassadors to uh, collect some of the questions that you later on would like, would like to, to come back to. I would like to call on uh, three more uh, uh, interventions before I go back uh, to the speakers. Uh, the, the next intervention is, uh, the next intervention is uh, from um, Dato' Abdul Majid. Belum Pak Dakri, Dr. Abdul Majid. Yeah, silakan Pak. Uh, thank you, Professor Devi, and thank you for the invitation. I just uh, like to add on uh, three points on uh, the points uh, mentioned by the previous speakers. One uh, is on while the pandemic has actually inflicted severe difficulties on our life, uh, but I think it's time uh, for opportunities to re-examine existing framework cooperation mechanism uh, so that actually we can prepare for future shock. I think uh, Professor Jamila did mention uh, that existing mechanisms are actually quite uh, okay and taking, for example, the ASEAN-China cooperation framework, there have been a very good uh, you know, mechanism that have been in place, but I think what we need is to make them more effective and more result-oriented. An example mentioned is the ASEAN-China cooperation fund. I think this is quite underutilized. I think it needs to be actually taken up. And I think uh, the difficulty I understand is on the ASEAN side. It appears to have some difficulty to reach consensus on project proposed. Second, going forward, I think for most government or for all government, the priority is to balance life and livelihood. I think uh, on the livelihood, it's a question of economic uh, revival and also how to promote growth in the future. So I think in this context, perhaps ASEAN need to strategize and study offers made by China on the various assistance, either bilaterally or through regional uh, outlets and also at the WHO. Thirdly, on the economic front, uh, this is something I think ASEAN I should look uh, quite urgently, how to facilitate uh, processes uh, of trade, investment, and also tourism flow. I think uh, China has started to propose fast track lanes, and I think some countries have taken up this. Uh, this is something uh, that ASEAN should look as a group, uh, how to facilitate and I think uh, to accelerate uh, the cooperation. And finally, I think most people have said post pandemic will be AI driven. Uh, there will be a lot of talk about economic, digital economic on the use of e-commerce and telemedicine. And I think this is something where China has, uh, you know, has the lead. And I think ASEAN should strategize and study uh, on the types of cooperation that ASEAN can develop with China on this front. Uh, I will end here. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul Majid. Yeah. Uh, next, I would like to invite Miss Yang Yang Yu from the uh, from China. Yeah. Miss. Yeah. Right. All right. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Professor Devi, and good morning, colleagues and excellencies. Um, so I do learn a lot from previous speeches. Uh, so first, I'd like to share with you what struck me most so far. Um, so first, I'd like to take this chance to speak highly of uh, ASEAN states solidarity and also timely mutual help between China and ASEAN states during uh, COVID-19 response. I think the biggest gain learned from pandemic for uh, both sides is that we share the same culture uh, with people as a center and we respect science and professional recommendations and adopt people oriented approach against coronavirus. And we value people's life most and multilateral cooperation and coordination. Uh, I think all these will be valuable assets and solid foundation for our future cooperation. And second, this pandemic also uh, witnessed great resilience of economic and trade ties between both sides, as previous speakers said. Uh, ASEAN became the largest trading partner of China. So this is historic and, in my view, attributed largely to protocol on upgrading uh, ASEAN-China FTA having come into force last year. So I think we need to maintain this momentum and uh, RCEP needs to be signed as scheduled this year to further promote regional economic integration. So based on uh, the information I got today about the development of ASEAN-China relations uh, during pandemic and also my own observations in previous months, I strongly believe uh, post-pandemic era will see much even uh, closer ASEAN-China relations. And as Professor Devi also mentioned this previously, it's exactly what we have seen right before about uh, the trend of ASEAN-China relations after we worked together to tide over the crisis such as SARS and also uh, financial crisis. And also in addition to cooperation proposals pre previously put forward by speakers and also officials, which I highly appreciate, for example, uh, share of vaccine. I think China has already, um, as President Xi Jinping said uh, in his uh, address at the WHO conference, uh, China uh, would like to share the vaccine as a global uh, a public goods uh, contributed to the global community. Um, so in addition to that, I also want to share my thoughts on our future cooperation, especially seizing uh, the opportunities of COVID-19 to strengthen our cooperation. Um, I think first and foremost, some speakers have also already mentioned, what is urgent for both sides for the time being to work together is to enhance cooperation on safely reopening. As we all know, China has already reopened and some ASEAN states uh, maybe are preparing to reopen. So we need to work on this, especially in the new normal of coexistence with coronavirus. Uh, we need to increase information experience sharing on measures and plans to safely reopen. For example, in China, we're now using a uh, health QR code as a kind of proof of uh, health status of a person. And I think it's helpful for tracing and to reopen, uh, as previous speaker said, every country needs to improve capabilities of testing and tracing, which is cornerstone for uh, COVID-19 fight. Uh, so we need to uh, enhance the cooperation on this. And also I think government and business in every country also need to work together to guarantee the safe reopening. Uh, for example, in China now, um, government and business, they, they discuss uh, how to reopen, right? For example, for the restaurants, how to set up the tables even in the proper distance in the restaurant to guarantee the diner's health. So it also requires uh, the cooperation discussions and communications between government and business. And second, I think is to, uh, we can enhance cooperation on mitigating negative impact of COVID-19 on society and economy. Um, I think on the social front, we need to focus on uh, poverty issue because um, it can be seen from COVID-19 response. It's really hard for countries with high poverty rate 
uh, to implement strict self-quarantine since people living under poverty line or close to poverty line, uh, they badly need to keep working to survive. And also COVID-19, like in China, they, they do, it does make some people return to poverty. Uh, so my institute, um, China Foreign Affairs University, is a country coordinating institute of uh, the network of ASEAN China think tanks, uh, which is also the only officially recognized track two dialogue mechanism of 10 plus one. And we launched a working group study on poverty reduction uh, during pandemic by sharing best domestic practices. And we also plan to hold a video conference in the upcoming month and publish our research outcome as well. So um, I think one of the practices in China to help people, uh, lift people out of poverty is with the assistance of e-commerce, that is e-commerce assisted poverty reduction. And it has been proved to be very effective during pandemic. And hopefully uh, this can be replicated in some ASEAN countries. And on economic front, um, in my view, I think cooperation on digital technology and economy should be prioritized. Um, amid the pandemic in China, the digital economy uh, played very important role in ensuring consumption and employment, and also promoting uh, resumption of production. And as, as is known to all, the digital technology has also been applied in COVID-19 response, right? such as tracing and long distance diagnosis. Um, I think on this, China and ASEAN countries have a broad common ground uh, in terms of strategic development of um, digital technology and digital economy. So I think we should, uh, we need to seize this year as an opportunity, uh, opportunity because this year is an ASEAN China year of digital economy cooperation to further strengthen our strategic uh, integration on this and jointly promote the construction of digital Silk Road. Uh, I think that will help us to mitigate the negative uh, economic impact of COVID-19, especially when vaccine is not available so to prepare for this uh, worst scenario. And we need to work together on building digital infrastructure so as to uh, bridge the digital divide in respective country. All right, I'll stop here. Back to you, Professor Devi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very important point because uh, uh, in some, some sectors are losing uh, and, and Clearly, we need we need to compensate with other with other sectors. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, if if we look at the ASEAN infrastructure development, the BRI, it's very strong on physical infrastructure, just airports, ports, and so on. And these are the sectors which is going to be, which is impact in fact direct, uh, directly impacted now. Tourism and so on. Uh, so how do we compensate the loss of economic opportunities from from this side of the economy? Uh, and, 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 and to what extent, you know, will the digital economy really replace it? Uh, I don't think touring Bali through, through the digital you know, is really going to, to help the local economy, the people uh, in Bali, you know, so this is, this is something that we also have, have to think about. Um, before I take on the, uh, the next batch of uh, interventions, I would like to invite uh, the speakers and the ambassadors, if they want to come in. I think Ambassador Deng wants to uh, join us. Uh, there was questions about vaccine, uh, about you know what is the future of, uh, what, the, to what extent are we really there uh, in, in uh, having uh, a vaccine and also international cooperation and so on. Uh, do I have Ambassador Deng? Yeah, right. Yes, Ambassador. Thank you. Actually, my colleague just now uh, mentioned that. And also in my uh, four proposals, uh, first is that uh, uh, first of my four proposals uh, is that we uh, should strengthen coordination between our competent authorities so that they could uh, better share information, exchange control measures treatment experience and the research outcomes in a timely fashion and the conduct joint research and development of drugs and the vaccine. Uh, specifically, uh, our uh, 
President Xi Jinping uh, also announced uh, uh, in the uh, World Health Assembly uh, a few days ago that COVID-19 uh, vaccine development and deployment in China when available will be a global public goods and uh, this will be uh, China's contribution to ensuring vaccine accessibility and affordability in developing countries. So uh, we are very open in this field. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Deng. Uh, but there's also concern about uh, inequality because usually research is very expensive. Uh, pharmaceutical companies patent you know, uh, their, 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 their products and uh, developed countries will not necessarily want to share uh, with developing countries. This is a struggle that developing countries, you know, like Indonesia and other developing countries, uh, including China, uh, also uh, have, have stressed the importance, you know, of getting uh, uh, equality and equity uh, in, uh, in the international era. Uh, but here, uh, as we know, the impact of the trade war, U.S.-China relations have also impacted the global public health. Uh, the U.S. has with threatened to withhold funding to WHO. Uh, and, and, and when we need international cooperation, the, the re reality of the, the G2's uh, strain relations really impact also global public health. Uh, how will, what do you think? Ambassador, then, you know, how can we overcome this? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, about the issue or question of the current strength uh, relation between China and the US and its impact on uh, ASEAN, I also would like to share with you uh, my observations. As for where we are and where we need to be in China US relations. Our position is consist consistent. As the largest developing country and the largest develop developed country, China and the US shoulder great responsibilities for global peace and development. It is imperative for us to seriously and properly handle our relations out of a strong sense of responsibility to humanity, to history, and to our peoples. Both China and the US stand to gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. This best captures what we have learned positive and otherwise from the past decades. Both sides should take this lesson to heart. China and the US have different social systems, but this is the result of the different choices made by the two peoples, which we must respect it is also true that we have many disagreements, but that does not preclude cooperation. When you think about the challenges facing today's world, almost all of them require coordination between China and the US. China remains prepared to work with the US in the spirit of non-conflict or confrontation, mutual respect and a win-win cooperation and build a relationship based on coordination, cooperation, and stability. At the same time, uh, we will also defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity, its legitimate right to develop, and the dignity and the place in the world which the Chinese people have worked so hard to earn. China has no intention to change, still risk the place the US it is time for the U.S. to give up its wishful thinking of changing China or stopping 1.4 billion people's historical march toward modernization. In short, for the fundamental and the long-term interests of the Chinese and American peoples and the well-being and the future of humanity, China and the U.S. should and must find a way of peaceful coexistence and a mutual, mutually beneficial cooperation, demonstrating that this is possible between two countries 
with different systems and the cultures. As both are important dialogue partners of ASEAN, China and the US support the centrality of ASEAN in regional cooperation. Though there are some competitions between China and the US in the region, we have also maintained sound interaction and cooperation in some regional issues. China is willing to keep dialogue and cooperation with the US in supporting the ASEAN community building and in dealing with common challenges together with ASEAN and other dialogue partners so as to play active roles on safeguarding peace, stability, and development in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Deng. We are, we are running out of time, but we have a number of discussants yet uh, who have not had their say. Um, Dr. Jayan Menon, you have been very patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Devi. Um, I presume you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me just very quickly um, uh, pick up on a few things that have been said today by the speakers and the discussants. Uh, the first point I think that was made was the roles of um, global, regional and national reactions um, to this uh, pandemic. I think... Um, Sorry, do we have a vision of you? Dr. Menon, do we have a visual of you? Um, yes, I think I'm here. Oops, it seems that I'm frozen, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, doesn't right, matter. Yeah, let me okay. just continue. Yeah, uh, I'll try and stop and start. Okay, anyway, so uh, as I was saying, um, I think the important thing here is to understand that you know, the main response, these are all complementary, not substitutes, um, these three different levels of uh, response. Um, and uh, while the main response might be national, this is a global pandemic, and we would have been best served by a multilateral response, but this has not been possible. Uh, G, the G7 couldn't even come out with the communique because um, the US insisted on Wuhan virus instead of coronavirus. And uh, G22 has been rather lame in its uh, response compared to say, the global financial crisis. So all the more important that we do a proper regional response to fill this void uh, that currently exists. And I think there are a few things that are naturally regional uh, that can benefit greatly from a regional response. We've heard already how ASEAN has been doing a lot in information sharing and the like, uh, and this is very useful. But I think I'd like to call for a revival of the ASEAN plus three grouping here, which has sort of uh, become a bit less active over the years because of geopolitical tensions between the plus three. This is a time to put those things aside, the opportunity to overcome them, uh, to come together to fight a common enemy. And I think uh, the ASEAN plus three, which is born out of a crisis, the Asian financial crisis, and is designed to deal with crisis, if not to try and avert them, is particularly well suited in this environment. Uh, it can now move on to helping coordinate uh, the fiscal stimulus programs. Uh, this is going going to be a long journey, the fight against the virus and the fight against the economic fallout. And I think we can coordinate the reactions a lot better going forward. And uh, also, I think we can deal better with uh, the kinds of um, uh, issues that will help us recover faster, like the travel bubbles and corridors that we've already uh, heard about. Um, let me now finish off by talking about uh, the uh, issue of um, the vulnerable, uh, you know, undocumented mi uh, migrant work workers, which is again a very much a regional problem. Uh, you know, the, like the invisible virus, um, a lot of these people are also invisible in many ways. And um, I think I'm in Singapore now at ICS, 
Uh, we have seen in Singapore how uh, the conditions of migrant workers uh, can create um, a massive uh, outbreak in those crowded dormitories. Um, and uh, this provides, I think, a bit of a lens into what, what might be happening in a lot of the uh, other countries with migrant workers that might be living in similar conditions. Uh, the Singapore experience, of course, is one where there's massive testing, which has allowed us to reveal the true nature of the problem. Uh, there's a lot less testing in many poor parts of the uh, developing world, and especially among these so-called invisible, undocumented migrant workers. So I think we need to be careful here uh, to avoid um, an explosion, uh, an invisible explosion that might be taking place in that community, uh, we should try and come together in addressing this uh, regional problem uh, as soon as possible. So let me stop there and thank you uh, for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time very, very quickly, but hopefully uh, we, can, we can extend our time because we started late. I have seven names here. So I would like to call on Dr. Henry Chan uh, from Cambodia Institute for Cooperation and Peace. Uh, you're on mute, I think. <laughs> I, I can't okay. hear you. Okay, right. You can hear me now? Yes, all right. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just have several points to make after listening to all the uh, speakers with very good uh, presentations. My point very is that, briefly. Uh, yes, very briefly. Now, number one, if you look at the number of cases around the world, the case is not true. We have more than 100,000 new cases every day, except that the center of epidemic now has shifted to Americas. In, um, in the United States, the cases has not really dropped. It hovers over 20 plus thousand every day. And in South America, it has been going up to almost 40, 50,000 daily. So what I mean to say is that we might have a sense of love that the cases is over because East Asia now is very clean. Europe is doing quite fine, but we have a third wave since coming in. Now, in this kind of cases, if there's a second wave, my personal feeling is that it's not going to hit us as bad because we have identified three measures that has been proven very effective, closing the borders, mass testing, and then also uh, surveillance. Now, in this aspect, if there's a second wave coming back, I think the impact will be more on the economic side, because again, we have to do those three things, which means close borders. Now, we have seen how the economics of close borders affecting ASEAN, particularly as pointed out by the earlier speakers on our tourism and service sectors. So my personal feeling is that there might be a need for China and ASEAN to accelerate in the next two, three months when the summer is here, when the transmission of virus is going to be more subdued, the green lane on the flow of goods. Because if there's a flow of goods, at least our manufacturing sectors will not slow down. And for our recovery in the uh, service sectors, we can also have this passport system as stated to allow some level activities to go on. Now, that's one thing I want to caution everybody is if you look at the WHO recommendation on lifting, the on reopening, they always want the countries to have two weeks of continuous dropping of new infections before a country is opening up. But if you look around, because of economic pressures, most of the countries opening up now is not following WHO recommendations. So I feel that number one, we have to accelerate China ASEAN Green Lane in the next one to two months. So in the unlikely event or in the likely event that this thing shoots back by the third quarter or fourth quarters, we will minimize the damage. And second is uh, the best practices around. We have seen many countries still not doing so good. And this uh, ASEAN plus three forum or this China ASEAN forum is a very good time for us to reevaluate this uh, best practices, because there seems to be not a sense of paradox of success. 
because in some countries we have been very successful to flattening the curve. So everybody thinks that the virus has died down and it's a natural that it will not reappear. And that is the one thing that I want to suggest to the group that we have to put more groundwork now in the next two months or else if there's a second wave, the social pressures on our CN is going to be very tremendous because we have already seen that how a lot of social issues has cropped up and our financial resources is being strained in something that never had happened in the ASEAN history or in all the history of Southeast Asian countries. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Chan. I, I think it's a very important point that we should not be complacent. And I think that the warning that the social economic impacts on the pandemic is going to be much more long term. And, and for fragile states like may, many, in fact, most of the countries in Asia, in, within ASEAN, uh, we are also talking about fragile uh, government. And uh, if we remember the Asian financial crisis in Indonesia led to traumatic uh, multiple crisis, and this is God forbid, we do not want to go in that direction again, but the concerns that the social economic impact is in fact as, as bad as during the, the financial crisis. Uh, but we need to be able, you know, we, we need to prevent that from becoming uh, an even more uh, serious social political uh, crisis. Uh, now I'd like to uh, call on Ms. Lydia Rudy from area. Yes, Lydia. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Daly. And thank you for the organizers for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. I would like to note that in addition to my position at Erie, I'm also on the Board of Governors for AmCham. And Dr. Dina emphasized the important role of B2B, which I would second um, in terms of including the business community in the solution. Governments can work with chambers of commerce to engage the private sector. So I'm gonna be brief, just make a couple of points first. China sent a powerful message of support by being the first country to have a ministerial meeting with ASEAN to work out common action plans. This led to the special ASEAN plus three summit in April, where a series of important commitments were made. China was also the first to support the COVID-19 ASEAN uh, rescue fund proposed by Thailand. And as we know from previous speakers, China has also supported several ASEAN members states by sending PPE, medicines, etc. Second, it's important to note that no one played the blame game. This, this is crucial in terms of building and maintaining trust, the key to any relation. Third, the challenge now is to operationalize some of the commitments already made, for instance, in the statements uh, uh, in the April summit. All of that takes large scale regional coordination and funding, which is why it makes sense to use the ASEAN plus three platform to realize some of these programs as Dr. Menon emphasized. Fourth, Ambassador Deng highlighted the importance of ASEAN led mechanisms playing an important role. This is key. We must maintain ASEAN centrality and neutrality. A stable and transparent relationship between China and ASEAN will not only provide a solid basis for working together but also serve to increase trust between China and the middle power countries of the region, including Australia and New Zealand. This relationship can serve as a platform to foster stronger bonds for the benefit of all EAS countries. Lastly, going to the question of long-term recovery, ASEAN has been actively transforming its social and economic systems in response to new fourth industrial revolution with adaptation of new technology. But when the pandemic first hit earlier this year, ASEAN was very concerned with supply shock as there was an, an immediate shortage of Chinese products. However, with the implementation of wide scale social distancing across many ASEAN member states, we now see a deeper crisis in terms of negative demand shock. This is the real challenge for ASEAN moving forward. To really understand the regional economy, one must understand the role of global value chains as crucial to production systems in the region. The value chain approach is unique to this part of the world, 
which is home to the most developed production networks. Thus, promoting and protecting global value chains is imperative moving forward. This growth in connectivity is key to protecting and promoting global value chains, but that has been disrupted and is expected to stagnate for the next couple of years as ASEAN countries recover. Public investment, one of the drivers of the expansion and hard infrastructure project for connectivity is likely to be depressed in the near future because of the massive funding reallocation and new government debt stemming from reviving the national health systems, providing stimulus or social safety nets. Thus, ensuring growth in connectivity is one of the critical challenge to be resolved. China with the BRI can be instrumental in addressing this issue. Uh, Iria is currently doing considerable amount of research on this and has already published a couple of policy briefs. So I will leave it at that and I'm happy to share any of the information we already have. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Lydia Rudy. Next, I would like to call on Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tan Kifang from China Institute for International Studies. We should be losing connection. Uh, this is Secretary Ku. I think we can move on. Uh, there may be some technical problems. Oh. All right. And then I would like to call on Dr. Uh, Van uh, Cambodia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Davy, and thank you, the organizer, for having me. Just a few uh, couple of comments uh, with regards to ASEAN China corporations and and the prospects or the way forward. Uh, my observation so far is that we have many statement uh, declaration to express our solidarity. But when we look at the activity and action on the ground, it's more at the national level. So I think we, when we mention about solidarity, we should also emphasize the unity of action or coordination on the ground. Uh, so that is something that I think ASEAN uh, and the dialogue partners uh, need to focus more on. Uh, second is uh, with regards to um, the regional response, I uh, support um, the comment by previous speaker that the ASEAN plus three uh, is the most effective way uh, in responding to the crisis. And I think there's a great potential for ASEAN plus three um, uh, to work uh, closely together to uh, uh, mobilize resources and actions uh, to effectively uh, uh, mitigate uh, the crisis. Uh, third point I want to make here is the um, uh, Ambassador Deng uh, mentioned earlier about uh, the green lane of, uh, of a fast track that China is negotiating with South Korea and now with Singapore. Uh, I think it's, it's if possible, I think China and ASEAN should also negotiate on this uh, green lane and, and fast lane in order to facilitate the movements of critical or essential goods and human resources across the regions. Uh, my final point here with regard to the vaccine and treatment, I think we need to make a strong uh, view and a point on this uh, ASEAN and ASEAN China at the multilateral uh, institution that we want the vaccine or treatment to be a global, common global good. So, we need to be firm and to send our message clear. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Uh, next, we, we seem to be having problem with, with connection. So that's quite unstable. Dr. Zhang Ji from uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, good. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, thank you, Professor Devi. Uh, actually, in this morning, uh, we have discussed a lot of uh, cooperation between China and ASEAN, and it is really important. However, as we know, the pandemic is uh, spreading glo globally. So even China and ASEAN would get uh, uh, recovery firstly. Uh, however, the regional supply chain and uh, industrial chain will also still affected by uh, other uh, regions. So my question is for Deputy Secretary uh, General of ASEAN. Uh, it is uh, how could ASEAN expand the cooperation to the other areas and the other uh, countries. And uh, besides uh, ASEAN uh, plus three, uh, who are the next uh, priority uh, partner? Uh, it would be Australia, uh, New Zealand, or uh, South Asia countries. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry, I lost connection there a bit. Uh, Dr. Zhangji, did you go on? Finish. Uh... Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I lost <laughs> connection. This is a problem with the digital economy and, uh, you know, connecting the world through digital, but we, we have a very unstable connection because everybody is now on Zoom. Uh, now, uh, Irene Chan from RSIS. All right. Yeah, I, I, I don't have audio for you. That's okay. Okay. We can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Irene, try again. Hello. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is much better. Um, hi, uh, thank you for having uh, for your kind invitation. And um, my, I have a sort of um, question with regards to uh, the strategic climate and and you know uh, security concerns um, during the COVID nineteen because uh, national security is something that you know doesn't close and doesn't reopen. It's you know it's something that we must continue all the time. So. My question for all, you know, the, the His Excellencies, you know, ambassadors, um, just like um, uh, the Chinese ambassador pointed out just now, you know, um, China continues to protect its territorial uh, sovereignty, integrity um, throughout the times. And um, so how can you, how can every one of us imagine um, what is a new normal or is, will there be even a new normal for regional security? Um, and especially, um, um, you know, the strategic calculations of power dynamics and influence, you know, um, yeah, this is my question, thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Uh, Ambassador uh, Jose Tafaris uh, to respond to you later on uh, after, after we finish the discussions. Now I'd like to Thank call you. on Dr. Duffery and after Dr. Duffery, we'll come back to uh, Dr. Tan Kifang. So Dr. Duffery. Thank you very much, Professor Devi, and also uh, good morning, so colleagues, as excellencies, and the participants. Thank you so much also for um, ABCI for inviting me. I think it uh, is an uh, important session. And special thanks to uh, Ambassador Deng for sending us uh, a box of masks, you know, which is a uh, very uh, useful for the uh, big family of political social uh, sciences faculty. Okay. Um, I have to uh, more as a critical of 
uh, opinion actually, or comment rather than question. The first one is uh, to the ASEAN as a regional organization, and the second one to the uh, relationship or cooperation between ASEAN and China. I think uh, we can note that the uh, uh, COVID-19 outbreaks have given us a very good lesson you know, for ASEAN especially as a regional organization. I would like to uh, express my opinion. I'm sorry to say that, but, but from my point of view, so far, um, it seems to me that ASEAN as a, as a regional organization is a bit stuttering or stammer, you know, in dealing with the COVID-19 issues. It can be understood actually due to the given nature of the ASEAN as a much more normative, formality, and the complexity of the decision-making process in the ASEAN itself. So this is why then uh, I suggest that the, the uh, future for uh, this um, COVID-19 actually can be good lessons uh, for ASEAN as organization to uh, what you call it, in review against about the, the norms, you know, of the ASEAN, like uh, um, one patience, one sort of uh, solidarity or something, especially on the regionalism. I think we, uh, ASEAN uh, member country have to uh, deepen you know, the, the meanings of uh, solidarity itself um, it, due to the uh, need to deal with the uh, pandemic like uh, COVID-19 uh, now. So uh, in the future, um, I think ASEAN need to prepare itself by do something structural and institutional as a form of maybe ASEAN can uh, build a kind of special body on health issues, like a regional special body on health issues, like a pandemic, and then strengthening the new uh, norms to deal with this kind of issues, and then focusing on the uh, prevention and recovery, uh, rather than uh, accidental action and policies, but uh, they do now. I know that uh, uh, ASEAN have a kind of uh, regional organization, uh, sorry, uh, cooperations on the health uh, issues, like uh, what did uh, the ASEAN's uh, health minister did uh, on uh, 14 of April. So they, they do kind of things there. They did a lot of uh, um, uh, agreement and blah, blah, blah. But unfortunately, that kind of agreement or something, just a kind of against the normative nature, just a kind of declaration rather than uh, practical labor. While uh, what we need now in the emergency situation, exactly the rapid action and uh, from the uh, ASEAN as a regional organization. And then the second one, in relation to China, uh, I think uh, there is no uh, deny that the uh, ASEAN and China cooperation so far is run well, and there are a lot of uh, productive uh, uh, policies, you know, uh, that uh, both sides uh, implemented in so far. But um, from my view, once again, you know, uh, most of this kind of cooperations you know, center or generally center on the commercial sector. I think by the uh, COVID-19, it is time for both sides, I mean, like China and ASEAN to, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, develop a kind of cooperation and more uh, what call it, humanitarian issues, uh, like uh, dealing with the uh, uh, non-traditional security trade, for example, you know, uh, including the uh, uh, pandemic like the COVID-19. Uh, one thing that we have to note actually you know, from the China side, it is a matter of facts and I think it's uh, undeniable that there are still a lot of negative sentiment or 
put in good species you know, uh, among the grassroots in the ASEP countries towards China. And then this kind of attitude and perception is seems to be the strengthening due to the uh, virus uh, um, um, issues now. So I think it is time for China especially and also ASEAN to do something at the same time, not only develop the or maintain the uh, good cooperation in this uh, commercial sector, but also in the humanitarian sector, which is a part of the uh, sub-diplomacy once again to put in put manage this kind of suspicious distrust and so on among the ASEAN uh, uh, people. I think that's the, uh, my uh, comment. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully I can uh, learn more from the other speakers and also the, the participants. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Daffrey. I think that's a very important point. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, uh, the, a lot of the criticisms on ASEAN, you know, where is regional cooperation uh, oh. when we need it, when, when each country uh, has to deal uh, yeah. with its own uh, immediate need. Uh, and the criticism is not just for ASEAN, many other regional organizations yeah. uh, are considered to be uh, less, less than stellar in, in their performance. And also, uh, when we need to pull together at the same time, there's a lot of egoism. And, and you, you, the, the important point uh, you make about the attitude yeah. towards China, uh, grassroots yeah. suspicion, I think that is very real. Uh, yeah. that, that, that we actually need to address that and suggestion yeah. for greater non-traditional security uh, yeah. cooperation. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Tan is back, so I'd like to call on Dr. Tan Kifan. Dr. Tan Kifan? We have lost you again. The audio isn't uh, showing up. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. We uh, Dr. Takipang asked, uh, uh, told us that he's back. Uh, we will be taking also uh, questions from, from the audience um, and uh, the Secretariat will inform me uh, if there are questions from, from uh, the audience. Uh, Dr. Takipang is not back yet. I'm going to call on, uh, I'm like to call on Dr. Sofian Albana who, was, who came late. Uh, because he had some uh, something to do this morning. So if Dr. Tang Kifang is not back, uh, I'd like to call on Dr. Sofan. Yes, uh, is it uh, okay to start now? Uh, would you? Yes. Yes. yes, okay. Uh, hello, uh, first of all, good morning, and thank you very much for uh, this very important opportunity. Uh, I'm really sorry for being late. There was a funeral this morning near my uh, neighborhood, despite the social distancing measures. Um, but anyhow, um, I think this discussion today is very uh, interesting and reassuring to see uh, that uh, most of us see the importance of uh, for the strengthening of regional cooperation uh, amidst and after this uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, I just would like to uh, raise uh, a point about the interconnections between uh, regional cooperation and national and global uh, situation. Uh, as we are all uh, aware, uh, regional cooperation is uh, needed, but as we have also seen, the fate of regional cooperation is pretty much also uh, not only related to the willingness of uh, uh, states or especially policymakers involved in uh, foreign relations to uh, to conduct the uh, cooperation, but also uh, tied to the domestic political uh, situation. And this, I think it is very uh, important to also put attention on how uh, various states are responding to this pandemic and how that uh, responses are affecting uh, regional cooperation and thus uh, maybe those involved in uh, regional uh, cooperation must also 
uh, anticipate this uh, the 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 impacts of this uh, different uh, national policies on uh, regional cooperation. Uh, for example, uh, the pandemic uh, creates um, challenges to legitimacy for many national governments in uh, ASEAN countries as well as uh, in other countries, uh, the US, China, anywhere. And uh, when uh, common response to declining legitimacy is usually trying to boost legitimacy through uh, hard stance in uh, foreign uh, policy, especially in security issues. You need to appear uh, powerful in front of your uh, people. So it is interesting to uh, to look at how uh, this crisis of legitimacy created by uh, this pandemic probably and probably this uh, is very much related to what uh, uh, Irene has mentioned uh, previously about the new normal in the security aspect in which uh, states probably are willing to uh, change the or to, to be more assertive in the uh, security issue, uh, um, mainly for domestic consumption, uh, to, to get their legitimacy back from uh, the damage of the, uh, created by the coronavirus. So uh, I, I would like to ask uh, the speakers on how do we mitigate this trend? How can uh, national governments maintain their legitimacy without sacrificing uh, a fragile trust in the region, which is already very uh, uh, fragile just by all uh, the ongoing cooperation. And it is worrying to see that uh, to compensate the decline in legitimacy, many countries are trying to, 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 to appear tough and it might it might cost uh, uh, the regional trust, which is uh, badly needed now. And uh, the second, uh, also on the connection between this national and uh, regional uh, levels of governance, is on uh, how uh, countries are experiencing this pandemic uh, rather differently. There are countries which is very uh, badly hit. There are uh, countries that are moderately hit. There are countries that manage it relatively well. There are countries that, um, uh, well, uh, well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but then uh, uh, these countries are having different policies in uh, opening up, which, um, how to say, somehow could lead to uh, to anxiety, to to distrust in in reconnecting the economy. I mean, like, even if a country uh, like Indonesia uh, is opening up uh, to the new normal, uh, will other ASEAN countries uh, trust Indonesia if we look at uh, the numbers? Or as well, not only in Indonesia, but also uh, the trust between uh, different countries. Could we rely on national data, which is now, we the only data available is the national data because even the uh, WHO uh, data must also take from uh, the, the, the source at the national level. Uh, so it's pretty much uh, the problem of uh, uh, trust in, in this issue. How, how to manage this? How uh, do we uh, balance uh, uh, regional uh, safety uh, and, and regional uh, public health with uh, maintaining trust to uh, national uh, governments of different countries with different uh, capabilities and different ways of uh, managing this pandemic. Thank you very much, Bu Dewi. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, questions from, from the uh, audience, uh, which I'll read out, and uh, Professor uh, Ambassador Deng, uh, all three questions are actually directed to you, so uh, uh, please be ready. I will I will read it out, uh, and also uh, maybe the other speakers uh, will also like to respond. For example, uh, maybe on the issues of the the, the tension between uh, 
national imperatives and the need for regional cooperation uh, that Dr. Sofian has mentioned. Maybe uh, Ambassador Tavares would like uh, to take that issue and maybe other, other speakers as well. Now to Ambassador Deng, there's a question from uh, Jia Jie. Uh, so what are the positive impacts of China's poverty alleviation and building a moderately prosperous, prosperous society in an all round way on ASEAN? especially on the post pandemic period. So I think the best lessons, uh, best practices from China, what, what can ASEAN learn from that? Uh, secondly, there's a question which is not really related to COVID uh, from Zhao Mian, uh, no affiliation. Uh, it says here that ASEAN and Hong Kong have very close co economic corporations. Recently, China decided to press ahead with the national security legislation for Hong Kong. Will it affect Hong Kong's status of international financial center and its economic cooperation with ASEAN? Uh, maybe pa Jose Tafares can answer this uh, question. And uh, last question is from Heru Zhu from Radio El Shinta of Indonesia. Also a question to Ambassador Deng. Uh, because of COVID-19 pandemic, some countries will withdraw their support uh, to BRI. Uh, what do you think? So I would like first to call on Ambassador Deng. Thank you. Uh, about the first question, uh, poverty, uh, poverty alleviation. Poverty yeah. yeah, poverty alleviation. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, you see, the, uh, this year, 2020, is the final year for China to win the battle against poverty. China will achieve a series of uh, ambitious goals as scheduled to lift all people living under the current poverty line out of poverty to complete the building of a moderate prosperous society in all respects and to achieve the first goal in the UN Agenda 2030 on sustainable development 10 years in advance. This is uh, China's contribution to the global cause of poverty reduction. As uh, President Xi Jinping pointed out recently, that the battle against poverty has come to the final and the most critical phase. We need to overcome the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and focus our efforts to crack hard nuts. We need to take multi faceted measures to consolidate what has been done and achieve complete poverty reduction with higher quality. And we need to go all in for the complete victory of the battle against poverty. China attaches great importance to poverty reduction exchange and cooperation with ASEAN countries. When Premier Li Keqiang attended the 70th ASEAN Plus 3 Summit in November 2014, he proposed the initi initiative of the Chinese government to allocate 100 million RMB to conduct poverty alleviation projects in the rural areas of ASEAN countries and set up pilot projects of poverty reduction cooperation in East Asia. The first group of projects have been launched in Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. China has also set up ASEAN-oriented key projects, including the ASEAN-China Forum on Social Development and the Poverty Reduction, and the ASEAN Plus Three Village Leaders Exchange Program. In the post-COVID-19 era, China remains committed to poverty reduction cooperation with ASEAN countries, contributing Chinese wisdom and solutions that are conducive to a better life of people in ASEAN. And about the, the, the Hong Kong uh, national security legislation, actually, you, you, you may all know that uh, the first session of the 
70th National People's Congress adopted yesterday the decision to establish and improve a legal framework and enforcement mechanism for safeguarding national security in Hong Kong Special Administrative Region after deliberation. We all know that national security is a basic precondition for the existence and development of a nation. However, since the abandonment bill disturbance in 2019, the Hong Kong independence and the radical separatist forces have become increasingly rampant with escalating violent terrorist activities. If you follow the Hong Kong situation closely, you can find the beating, smashing, and the burning in many places in Hong Kong since last year, which has seriously put Hong Kong into turmoil and endangered normal life of Hong Kong people and the social order. To make things worse, foreign interfering forces and the Taiwan independence forces have blatantly stepped up intervention in Hong Kong affairs. Among those writers, you also could see falling faces, falling flags, and hear them singing falling national anthems, all of which severely undermines Hong Kong public security, seriously challenges the bottom line of one country, two systems principle, and poses real threats to the national security of China. The reason for the problem is that since the return of Hong Kong 23 years ago, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region has not acted out its constitutional duty for national security in line with China's constitution and the basic law. There is a clear loophole in Hong Kong's legal system and the absence of a mechanism of enforcement. All these have left Hong Kong unprotected. Actually, in all countries, unitary and the federal alike, only the state legislature has the legislative power on issues concerning national security. The Chinese central government bears the primary and the ultimate responsibility for safeguarding national security, which is the core of one country, two systems, and the foundation for its existence. Only when national security is ensured can Hong Kong enjoy prosperity and stability. To establish and improve a legal framework and enforcement mechanism for safeguarding national security in Hong Kong is to prohibit a very small number of people from splitting the country, subverting state power, organizing and carrying out terrorist activities and the falling and external forces from interfering in the Hong, Hong Kong affairs. It will protect the law-abiding Hong Kong citizens who are the overwhelming majority, guarantee the legitimate rights and the interests of Hong Kong residents and the foreign institutions and the personnel in Hong Kong, and the safeguard the fundamental interests of the state and the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. It also serves the common interests of the international community, including ASEAN member states. We know very well that there are strong economic, commercial, and cultural relations between ASEAN countries and Hong Kong. So people should have more confidence in Hong Kong's future. A legislative process will be set in motion following the adoption of the National People's Congress decision. This will improve Hong Kong's legal system and bring more stability, stronger role of law, and a better business environment to Hong Kong. It will protect the basic principle of one country, two systems, and Hong Kong's position as a global financial trading and shipping center. I believe that it will be conducive to the long-term prosperity and stability of Hong Kong, as well as the enhanced economic and the commercial cooperation between Hong Kong and ASEAN. About the uh, 
third question. Uh, Can we make it much uh, briefer, uh, Ambassador? Yeah, we are running out of time. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Very brief comment on impact of COVID on BRI. Uh, yes, it's about belt and road. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, to say that uh, there is no inherent connection between the belt and the road initiative and the debt problem of some countries, and that no country has been embroiled in debt crisis because of China's investment. While uh, working no, the question with... is, no, no, the question is whether COVID-19 has an impact on the enthusiasm of countries to take part in BRI. Has it impacted at all? Do, do you see future impacts on that? Uh, about the, the impact on tourism, right? Yeah, so the impact of COVID, you know, the impact of coronavirus on, yes. uh, on participation in the RI. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, the, despite the impact of COVID-19, Chinese investment in Belt and Road partner countries increased by 11.7% in the first quarter and trade with them was up by 3.2%. Steady progress is being made in the China Laos Railway and the dual fuel power plant in Cambodia. Construction has resumed for a number of projects suspended due to COVID-19. All this will generate strong impetus for the host country's efforts to beat the virus and revitalize the country. Belt and Road Initiative responds to the call of countries for development and meets the fundamental interest of the international community. It will enable countries to work closely together to fight common challenges such as COVID-19 and draw on each other's strengths for win-win cooperation. We have the confidence that after the pandemic, the Belt and Road Initiative will show even greater vitality with synergy from more countries towards a world of common prosperity. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Deng. Uh, we have uh, spent two and a half hours of uh, discussions, uh, very rich discussions on ASEAN-China relations uh, in uh, mitigating the impact of COVID-19. We have covered issues of health, we have covered the issues of social economic uh, impacts and at the national, regional and global level and also the way forward uh, in living uh, with COVID-19 in uh, the new uh, normal uh, era. And uh, there have been several proposals, among others, I think that is worthy of note, is that uh, we need to strengthen existing ASEAN-led mechanisms uh, that uh, while there have been criticisms about the uh, strength of ASEAN cooperation and solidarity during during uh, this uh, crisis as each country tries to look uh, inward uh, to grapple with internal uh, problems. Uh, we have also seen very strong cooperation. China uh, has been very, uh, very generous and also uh, during the early days of the crisis, ASEAN countries have also been very supportive of China and uh, as one of the uh, discussants mentioned, you know, we are not uh, engaged in blame game, but how to go forward, how uh, to, to, to go from strength to strength uh, in, uh, uh, in the post-crisis uh, area. So uh, we, we are hopeful that from this crisis, there'll be a lot of lessons learned. Uh, we do not need always to in, uh, uh, create new mechanisms. Although Dr. Duffy mentioned that maybe in the ASEAN-China cooperation, the emphasis has been too much on economic cooperation, maybe there needs to be uh, more attention, more investment also being paid on, on non-traditional uh, security uh, issues. The strengthening of the ASEAN 
plus three institution has been mentioned also uh, by, by a number of discussions by uh, Dr. Menon, for example. Uh, and uh, the need to ensure that uh, ASEAN and China can also uh, hope, uh, help to uh, strengthen multilateral cooperation, uh, the, the, the access to virus, which is equitable uh, to all. Uh, I will not try to summarize these very rich discussions because uh, uh, all the speakers have been very, very clear in, this, uh, in, in their remarks. Uh, but there are issues that we also need to raise. Uh, there are, every country is vulnerable, but some are even more vulnerable than other, others. We need to pay greater attention to the issues of migrants. Migrant workers are vulnerable, but uh, the Andaman crisis uh, uh, should not escape notice because uh, this is uh, an ongoing crisis that ASEAN countries and also uh, China uh, need to address uh, because this is a humanitarian tragedy uh, that we have not really resolved yet in, in our region. Um, now I would like to return uh, uh, the, uh, the floor to the MC, to Cindy, uh, for the closing remarks uh, from uh, the founder of the FPGI. Yes, thank you very much. Very much. Yes. To conclude today's Jakarta Forum, I would now like to invite the founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, Dr. Dino Patijal, for his closing remarks. Silakan. Okay, I hope you can hear me. And uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Dewi Fortuna Anwar for being a great uh, moderator. And I want to thank uh, all our speakers, uh, but especially Ambassador uh, uh, Teng uh, Sijun, uh, Ambassador of uh, China to ASEAN, uh, Deputy Secretary General Kong Kwak, and also my good friend Jose Antonio Marato uh, for their earlier remarks and all the discussions. Uh, this has been a very uh, rich, uh, good, and, and honest discussions, uh, and, and I think all of us uh, enjoyed it and including the public uh, out there. I, 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 I'm reported there's about more than a thousand people who are listening in. So thank you all for listening. Uh, and I want to say that uh, what we covered today was quite wide. Well, we covered uh, conceptual uh, dimension, policy dimensions, and also the practical uh, steps uh, in addressing the challenge of COVID-19. And, you know, ASEAN is 53 years old and there has been uh, very few occasions uh, seismic historical challenges, uh, which has uh, prompted ASEAN to respond um, uh, significantly. You know, I, I can say, uh, at least for example, the uh, uh, Cambodian conflict, uh, one event, uh, the end of the Cold War, another event, the financial crisis of uh, 1998, and also the 2008 financial crisis. And these are historical events that uh, force ASEAN to respond in significant way. And I think uh, COVID-19 uh, is uh, one of those milestone uh, events because why? It affects all ASEAN nations uh, in a very uh, deep way. Uh, I do think that the COVID crisis is something that can and should and must make us closer. Uh, because uh, this is also something that is uh, affecting not just ASEAN, but the whole world. Uh, and uh, uh, this is also an a crisis that uh, will be proven uh, to uh, make uh, ASEAN and China uh, closer in terms of the, their cooperation. And why do I say this? Uh, because developing a response and solidarity uh, during crisis is really more pummel times. And I think what is important is that ASEAN-China cooperation uh, should be science-based, it should be need-based, uh, what does ASEAN need, and, uh, and it should be a resource-based. Uh, I agree with what uh, Dr. Pra Parani said uh, from WHO that uh, who has more resources uh, should help those who have uh, less uh, resources. Uh, so uh, that's why I think, uh, uh, China's cooperation with ASEAN countries is uh, well appreciated. Uh, and why this is so? Because uh, China is the first victim of this virus uh, and China has the know-how uh, and China has the political will uh, to uh, cooperate uh, with uh, ASEAN uh, countries. Uh, I should say, I think uh, th there has been some important things that, that has changed the way uh, we are uh, handling this crisis. Uh, I, th I think the Wuhan uh, lockdown was very important uh, step for uh, the rest of the world, including Indonesians uh, to see. Uh, 
uh, if I can name three things that that has changed the way policymakers can uh, affect their population. One is the Wuhan lockdown, the total lockdown of the city, um, the closure of Kaaba uh, in Makkah, uh, and uh, the the what happens in Italy. Right. Without these three things, uh, without these three events, uh, I think policymakers in Indonesia would have a really hard time convincing the, the population that we need to take some drastic measures. And I don't think uh, the, the, the PSBB, the partial lockdown that is happening in Indonesia can be taken uh, without those reference to those uh, three earlier uh, 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 events, right? Uh, so, uh, so ASEAN China cooperation is in good shape. Uh, I think it's one of the best cooperation that ASEAN is having in terms of COVID management. Uh, I think the challenge will be on the technical ministry. To be honest, uh, you know the foreign ministries deal with one another all the time, the diplomats and ambassadors and the director generals. Uh, but if you look at the health uh, ministries and uh, immigration and all the other uh, ministries, uh, this is uh, where I think uh, they need to step up uh, across ASEAN and, and China in terms of cooperation, because they, I think they are less used uh, to this kind of uh, fast paced uh, substantive uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, I do hope that uh, the ASEAN China cooperation on COVID-19 can be one of the models of global cooperation uh, on tackling COVID-19. You know, I say this because international cooperation was really slow to develop. You know, the, when the virus came uh, in, in uh, late uh, uh, December, uh, uh, you know, international cooperation did not uh, uh, move until I think February and, and and so on. You know, it was really slow, uh, and uh, also uh, you know we're still seeing a lack of uh, of global leadership uh, right now. Yeah, uh, uh, and and I think uh, this is why uh, what China is trying to show that is uh, trying to do more than it should uh, to help other countries uh, uh, is, is 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 good to see. Yeah. Uh, the world is definitely watching China. Yeah. Uh, why? Because this is such a historic uh, crisis uh, and big countries are always being watched on how they behave. Uh, uh, you know, so far, I like what I hear and see, and we encourage China to keep saying the right things, right? Uh, this, uh, and to keep doing the right things, uh, to keep saying the right things, uh, meaning this is a uh, we have shared uh, future, shared humanity, uh, the global vaccine, uh, the vaccine should be a global public good. You know, these are the things that uh, the world wants uh, to hear and, and needs to see uh, uh, realized in, in, in policy terms. Uh, I also want to strike uh, how important it is uh, that the ASEAN-China cooperation uh, is uh, impactful to the grassroots. Yeah, and why do I say this? Because, uh, you know, ASEAN, is 53 years old, uh, but in, in many ways, it's had a hard time uh, going to the grassroots. Uh, I think in Indonesia, uh, if you ask, uh, you know, it's my favorite anecdote. If you ask uh, how many percent of the population understand what the ASEAN economic community is, I would say it's, it's like 2%, right? Uh, even that's uh, an ambitious uh, uh, number. Some people say it's 1% or less than 1%. But the point is uh, ASEAN uh, challenge has been really to go to the grassroots. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, this is uh, where I think uh, the grassroots is most affected by this now. Uh, and this is where uh, the grassroots need to see uh, ASEAN is relevant to their problems and also ASEAN-China uh, cooperation is, is uh, relevant uh, to their problems. And, you know, this is why the supply of PCR from China, uh, medical mass uh, and so on and so on. This is very relevant at the moment to, to show to the grassroots that uh, uh, when the public is having a, a difficult time, ASEAN and, and, and China are there to, to try to uh, make a difference. Uh, another point, uh, oh, by the way, on the grassroots, I need to say what one thing that worries me is really the rise of conspiracy theories, right? Uh, again, uh, some celebrities are taking this up uh, and some iconic people are taking this up and so on, uh, opinion leaders. Uh, and it's really troublesome because uh, uh, more and more people are believing uh, in this, uh, you know, the Bill Gates theory uh, and this and that, you know, uh, and, and uh, I, I really hope that uh, ASEAN and China 
uh, in terms of governments can maintain uh, the science-based and rational uh, policy-making process and not give in to this wild populist conspiracy uh, theories. Uh, the other one, uh, the other comment I want to make is that uh, I think it's, it's interesting to see if the COVID-19 agenda uh, will push aside the other agenda or uh, is there a realization that the COVID agenda should be uh, kept uh, in uh, complement with the other agenda, the trade agenda, the investment, education, diplomatic, climate, and all the other agenda. You know, I say this because I think the thinking within every nation now is, uh, and it's especially true for Indonesia, hey, COVID agenda means all the other things are forgotten or push aside for now, right? Uh, again, I don't, uh, I'm not saying that one is right over the other, but we need uh, to, to understand uh, that uh, this is happening now. Uh, and uh, where are we going? Uh, COVID pushing the other agenda aside or COVID and all the other agenda treated as part of the same solutions to this grand problem. Uh, and I think one of the key questions uh, now is uh, what happens to the uh, economic uh, dimension of uh, COVID-19. I agree with all the other speakers who spoke about this. Uh, Ambassador Deng uh, rightly pointed out uh, that uh, trade remain at uh, went up at about six percent. Yeah, uh, but I would caution because uh, that's Q1, and quarter two it will be a lot lower. Uh, just as Indonesia's economic growth uh, in quarter two is a lot lower, and so is Singapore. Uh, I think so is Malaysia, Philippines, and 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 all the others. So we have really a challenge on not just dealing with COVID-19 in terms of the health, uh, public health factor, but in terms of economic fallout. And I think the most serious thing that we need to anticipate is the jobs avalanche, right? Uh, the, the, the rising new poor uh, in ASEAN countries, uh, maybe in China too, I don't know the situation there. But uh, in Indonesia now, uh, uh, we expect uh, 5 million people at least uh, joining the new poor as a result of them be becoming unemployed. Uh, and, and uh, unpaid leave and so on. And this is gonna create a serious economic and social crisis, even political, right? If this is not handled right. So the ability of ASEAN to respond economically uh, in a way that is relevant to this and the, uh, and, and the way of China to, to remain relevant to ASEAN's economic future, uh, especially in terms of trade, investment, uh, tourism, education, technology, and all that uh, will be very uh, critical in, in the near term. Uh, and the other thing is also, as, uh, I, I like uh, the advocacy that ASEAN and China uh, should have uh, increased cooperation in WHO, right? Uh, I'm gonna turn this off, sorry. Uh, uh, I like I like that they have to increase uh, cooperating WHO because you know you know I fear that WHO is being seen as uh, uh, it can be made into a scapegoat uh, on on the COVID uh, nineteen issues and this is going to be very dangerous if if this happens right because. Uh, WHO is the place where we all need to cooperate and where we need multilateral solutions. Uh, and we really need to maintain uh, the, the, you know, the, the integrity of WHO and, and just make sure that uh, it's not uh, going to be turned into scapegoat or uh, you know, uh, political football over there, although that is probably going to be uh, inevitable. Uh, and finally, um, the... Uh, the big elephant in the room that we're not uh, discussing, which is uh, the U.S.-China uh, rivalry. You know, I, I know Dr. Dina uh, talked about it, right? But, uh, you know, this is going to be affecting how the world is responding to COVID-19 uh, and, you know, some impact on, on ASEAN-China cooperation as well. And, you know, I, I have to say that Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN countries really not interested in the U.S.-China rivalry. Right. Uh, we think it's not uh, relevant for the problem that we're facing now. And we really hope that uh, the U.S. and China really can get along and, and work together to address COVID-19. And, and, and uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, the political situation in, in the U.S. now in the run up to the elections uh, would make it impossible uh, for for that uh, to, to happen.
right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, but uh, the question for ASEAN is: uh, Look, does ASEAN stay mum on this? <laughs> we stay quiet. We pretend, pretend it's not happening, or do we actually speak power, uh, truth to power? You know, uh, don't be shy to tell the U.S. Look, you know, uh, we gotta do things a bit differently. Uh, at this uh, at this moment, you know, uh, don't don't uh, get too much into this rivalry business at a time when uh, we need more cooperation, right? So, uh, I, you know, it's a question of whether or not ASEAN would would be willing uh, to 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 uh, step up uh, and 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 uh, you know uh, take a stand a stand on this, uh, and and uh, so with that, I want to say thank you uh, with. Uh, to everybody who took part uh, in this, uh, I think uh, you know the big question that we face now is not just how do we recover, right? Uh, but how do we rebound even better? You know, I know a lot of people are asking this question. There are about ten trillion dollars of uh, stimulus uh, now globally uh, that will be uh, thrown into. Uh, uh, countries that are affected by COVID and to make sure that uh, they recover well. But the question is not just uh, how the, uh, or when they would recover, but how this $10 trillion of stimulus can make the world rebound better and, and stronger, uh, uh, which means that uh, how do we make this $10 trillion stimulus uh, make the economy uh, free from COVID, uh, healthier, but also greener, uh, more resilient, more inclusive, more carbon free, uh, and more fair. Yeah, because uh, I do expect that the, the, the uh, what do you call it? I do expect the uh, COVID-19 will create a more inequitable uh, economy and society. Uh, and this is why the, the task of how do we rebound better will be the, the most important uh, historical, intellectual, and policy questions uh, for the world and also for ASEAN and China. So uh, I, I've spoken too long, uh, but thank you so much. This has been a great uh, uh, discussion, and I look forward to the second Jakarta Forum, where uh, we hope to have uh, equally, if not even better, speakers and, and uh, uh, discussions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Padino. And of course, thank you to all our speakers and participants during today's discussion. Uh, before we close, I would like to mention that FTCI will be holding another virtual dialogue with the topic democracy in the time of COVID-19 on June 2nd, 2020 at 2 p.m. So feel free to have a look on our social media page at FTC Indo on Instagram for more information on upcoming events. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our first Jakarta Forum 2020. Thank you to everybody, both on our Zoom meeting and also those watching live on YouTube who tuned in and participated. Uh, good afternoon and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Thank you Thank for you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ibu Dina. Bye. Thank you, Ibu Dewi. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Dina. Thank you. Dr. Dewi. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassadors. Thank you, Excellencies. Thank you, Ambassador Deng. Jose, everybody, thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.